Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. The truck series from when I started in it in 08 and 09 with TRG, and then I went back to Kevin's for a year, and it was like old school cup racing. The one thing I hated about racing all the years was that next deal. You gotta find that next deal. You gotta find that next deal. Ah, my kid needs braces. I gotta find that next deal. My kid's going to college. I gotta find that next deal, right? I think September of 2018 at Richmond was the last race I ever got paid to go work. And I walked out of there and nobody cared. Nobody gave a shit. I put my whole life into it. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. Crystal let me fly up on the plane for nothing, and I went up to Michigan, and uh, Wayne Auden, who's the greatest guy ever, by, by the way, he, uh, he got me a pit pass so I could get in because I didn't even have a NASCAR license over this. You know, they're expensive, so I didn't buy one. And got in the garage and started walking around, and Tommy Baldwin gave me a chance to come work at Yates to run their pull-down rig. And I had done a lot of pull-down stuff, seven-post stuff, you know, at Childress and this and that. And uh, Andy Petrie had built the Petrie plate, the first Petrie plate, right? So when we won Daytona with Stuart when I was working at Harvick's, we went up to Andy's house where he had the very first one, and me and Andy pulled that car down together. And... Andy deserves a lot of credit for that win because he, he taught me something on that pull-down plate that about spring angle that I hadn't seen. So Andy's one of my favorite people. He's still to this day. He's a great guy. So I went to work for them, and they were really struggling. They weren't coal binding. They weren't doing a lot of things, and they were way behind. And I think uh, Slugger Labby was the crew chief on the other car for Jarrett and um, – Tommy was doing Elliot's car, Eminem's car. So I kind of showed him how we coal bound and stuff, and we went to Chicago and qualified better and still needed to do some work. The cars were way behind, and and this is nothing against Doug and, and Robert. They're both the greatest people around. They're, they're so genuine, right, both of them. But they were just way behind. They had, Robert told me, he goes, I don't even know how to look for a sponsor. They always came to me. So when we lost the yeah. – the, the you know the um, um, UPS deal they didn't know what to do yeah. right and Doug was completely immersed in Roush Yates engines so he didn't have a lot to do with it so now were you at I, what point did you become a crew chief well so I'll get to that so we were um, well, I was doing the pull down work and going to the racetrack and kind of just consulting and mainly working with Tommy I didn't have a really good relationship with um, um, Slugger he he didn't really want the help right and he was doing DJ's car so. Something happened at Pocono while they were there, and I, I wasn't privy to it. And we got back, and the 88 had almost rubbed a hole in the bottom of their oil cooler. They were over-traveling. He was doing this trick where he was preloading the bar and taking all the rounds out of the car. It was illegal, but they were getting it through tech. And they got into a big argument. I was in my office, which is right by the pull-down rig, and sitting there, and him and Tommy and Robert were out there, and, man, they were going at it, all three of them. And Robert fired them both on the spot. And I'm like, wow and he stormed out of there so i didn't know what my fuck i hope i don't get fired right because tommy hired me so about four hours later i get called up to the office and said hey you're going to do dale's car and uh cully Bearclaw is going to do elliot's car okay so <laughs> i'm a cup crew chief and dale was so good to me he did not have to accept any of this i think he already knew he had something cooking with toyota right to go to Michael's. There was some of that was, I'm sure that was all happening behind the scenes, right? That stuff doesn't happen in just a day or two, <clears throat> but he was great to work with. And we started kind of undoing, unpacking the setup and trying to get back to it. And we went to uh, California and we ran pretty good. I think we finished fourth and uh, we'd seen some gains, you know, we were getting better and uh, he decided to leave at the end of the year. And this, I got to another turning or another crossroads. He wanted me to go to Michael's with him. And Jason Burdett, who was our car chief, who's a brilliant guy, great chassis guy, smart as hell about racing, he's going to go too, right? Well, I decide 
Robert's been really good to me, and he's paying me more money than I ever made in my life. I mean, when you get to be a cup crew chief at that level, it, it pays really good, right? And I had never really got that, and I was kind of shocked by it. I had a brand new Lincoln Navigator to drive, and personal relationship with Edsel Ford, you know, because he'd come by the shop all the time, and so I stayed. And Jason came to me and said, I'm going. I said, I think it's the best thing. You, you're ready, dude. Go do it. Go both feet, all you got, right? And so they went to do that deal. And I stayed on a little bit of a false premise because Robert had kind of promised me we were going to get a young fire-breathing driver to replace Dale. Well, a lot of stuff's happened behind the scenes that I don't know about, right? Well, Fort's over with. In walks Ricky Rudd, and he's going to drive the car, and he hadn't driven in two years, and I don't know Ricky at all. And when I was around, Ricky wasn't really a factor at most races. And not that Ricky's not a great race car driver, because to get to that level and do all the things he did, he's obviously super talented. So we, we start off kind of slow and get to know each other. Well, this is the year where they're running half of the old car, the twisted sister cars that are just really jacked, right? and the, the infamous wing COT. <laughs> so we're way behind on engineering. We don't. We have one engineer. It's uh, Travis uh, Geisler is my engineer. He's now the head of Penske, right? Yeah. And Travis is smart, but we have no tools, nothing, right? So we struggle along, run a cup, okay, a couple times. We go to, so we built a brand new twisted sister car, built the chassis ourselves. It was all TIG well. This thing was beautiful. One of the nicest cars I ever built. It was a part of building. And uh, we go to California Speedway, and we qualify good, and we're running good. We're, we're running top five. I'm thinking, man, okay, we're starting to turn the corner on this deal. Ricky's happy. He's racing. You can tell. You can hear by his voice. So he he goes to pass Jeff Gordon on the outside for, like, third, and he passes him, and Jeff misjudges it and clips him trying to get in. You know, it's the draft, so he's trying to get in behind him. And he, Ricky kind of saves it and turns back into the fence, and it hits a ton. Where is this? California Speedway, and it breaks Ricky's shoulder. And come to find out, he had gone up in the seat the way it landed, mm -hmm. and that hadn't happened much, and it broke his shoulder. So we were we were screwed. Yeah. All the gains we'd made, all the work we'd done to get to know each other, everything we'd done, we're screwed. So I'm begging him to get Johnny Sauter to come drive the car. Well, and I want to be upfront about this. Kenny's, Kenny Wallace is a nice guy, and he's a mediocre race car driver, right? Always was. He had a time when he was pretty good, but not, not at this point. Well, he walks in, and he's going to be the driver. So this is like a lead balloon in our shop, all the guys. He really got the deal because he was going to wear the Snickers fire suit on TV on his post-race show that he did. Remember, they did that deal. So this is really bad for all of us. And this, this COT is a handful to drive. There's no travel. We've gone down the wrong path on the bump stops, so we're having to back up. And I need somebody that can really hustle one of these things to keep us where we're at. Ricky's or uh, Kenny's a super nice guy. He treats everybody with awesome respect. We, we were fine. We got along fine. But we, frankly, we ran bad the all year. So at the end of 07, I got fired. And I really felt that was wrong because I didn't feel like I got a fair shot at all. But little did I know they were selling the team, right? Because that was when all that went on, when it went to Roush and all yeah. that stuff, yeah. right? So I understood later what happened. And Robert was awesome to me. He gave me like four months severance pay, which was a huge amount of money, right? And I was like really thankful to him. So I... Me and my youngest son, we were racing RC dirt cars, and he drove a little bit for Tony Stewart, who owned Custom Works, which is one of his little hobby companies. So we went to the Nationals that winter. I didn't think much of it. We were okay financially. Everything was good. And I get a call at the Nationals, and it's Andy Lolly. And he, uh, he says, hey, we're putting a truck team together. Would you mind coming to interview for the crew chief deal? And I'm like, yeah, sure, that'd be cool. So that's that's how my cup career went. It wasn't great. I don't think we we didn't make a mark. And you know yourself, you're probably the highlight of it was we figured out a coal bind deal at Daytona for qualifying, and we put both cars on the front row at Daytona that year in uh, 07. You remember that? We sat both of them on the front row. So 
that was something that uh, a dear friend of mine that's a great shot guy and me worked out in Asheville on the Olin's seven post they had up there. Robert gave us 30 grand to go buy time up there, which is like pulling teeth from him because he didn't believe in all that, right? It was motor and trick setups. And we'd worked out this coal bind deal in the right front. And so what it did is it didn't rub the valence. And remember how you'd leave and you'd kill the valence and then it wouldn't be as quick the second lap. Well, we figured out how not to do that. And it was, it was like 18 counts of drag in the middle of the corner. And we put both cars on the front row. So it was kind of cool. That was, that was the highlight of the year for us. <laughs> so you sent me a, a, some bullet points of the teams that you've worked with and, and everything. And you talked earlier about doing some roundy round uh, sports car racing. And you actually wound up racing IMSA. And then in 2009, you won the 24 hours at Daytona. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, Andy had uh, called me to do the truck deal in 08. And he, uh, he was racing the IMSA car for TRG or the racers group. And that's the company that was running these cars at the time. So they needed a little help in 08 to go down and call the race on one of the rental cars. So I went down and did it, and we finished second. So I kind of got a taste for it, and I'd done it earlier in my career. And the Rolex is a really cool race. When you sit in the driver's meeting, there's F1 drivers in there. There's yeah. cup drivers. There's people from all over the world. It's really neat. Mario Andretti was there. You know, I mean, just it's, it's a really cool environment and the race is really hard i mean you think about it 24 hours going hard they don't they don't ride around anymore they they go hard the whole time so we went through 08 and the truck deal andy didn't do that great you know trying to transition to ovals and so in 09 um we were getting ready to take jr fitzpatrick and do some races for him out of canada he was like the next kid out of canada really talented young man his father had a big company a big crane company so they had funding too which is the greatest thing you can get nowadays, right? A, yeah. a talented young man with funding. So Andy was going to partner with Justin Marks to do the full season in IMSA, in the GTD class, which is like Porsches, Ferraris, Aston Martins, stuff like that. So he came to me and said, hey, what do you think about getting involved with building our new car? And I'm like, yeah. He, so we talked a lot about – and I, I'd always – you know, they were in the same shop with us, so I knew them guys and talked to them. And they, the, a Porsche is a unibody car. So over time, when you race it like that, it gets pretty flexible. So we talked about some ideas to, to fix that, right, and to do some things. So they <laughs> – Justin agreed to fund it, and so we brought – a they bought a brand-new GT3 Porsche from Stuttgart. It came into Atlanta on the plane. It, this is like a $350,000 car, right? They bring it up to the shop, and they got three or four contract mechanics that work on the car during the season, right? And they work like – they have a different thing. They do, like, contract work, right? They don't really work for the team. So he's like, well, what do you want to do? I said, take it all apart. And he goes, what do you mean? It's brand new. I said, all apart, all the way to the chassis. So they were – Andy had to come in and kind of get everybody on the same page, right? Hey, we're going to do this and this and that. So we took it all, we tore it all the way down. It had all the parts laid out on tables. And we soda blasted the car. A friend of mine came over and he soda blasted it because it's got all these like little pockets and stuff in it. So we didn't want to sandblast it and have that weight. And then we washed all that out because the soda would melt. And then we went back and we missile rod welded all the seams. And then this great fabricator friend of mine, <laughs> Tyler LaBelle, he raised the the big problem was wheel clearance, so you couldn't travel the cars like. And you know, being a NASCAR guy, we're like, we got to travel, we got to get this thing yeah. on the ground, right? Yeah. So he went in and he bought this tool, and we were able to raise the rear wheel tubs up in the car an inch and a half, and you couldn't tell it. You could not tell it when he got done with it. This guy's a talented fabricator, right? Then he, you were allowed to open up the wheel wells because the tire clearance, right? So we, he built really nice wheel flanges for it and everything. We put it all back together. Every single piece we worked on. I mean, every bracket got drilled. We threw a bunch of stuff away. We had, I mean, we probably took 30, 40 pounds off the car, and it was way stiffer. We added some bars, this and that. And then he's like, well, I said, we need to go to the wind tunnel. He's like, what do you mean? That's expensive. I don't think we can do that. So it, 
Aerodyne has two tunnels over there. A lot of people don't know this. They have their full-blown tunnel. Then they have a thing called a B tunnel over there that's like only $200 an hour. It's not active, and it doesn't roll the wheels, but you can do some ABA testing in it. So we took the – this car has coilovers in it, so we put bump stops in it and took all the rounds out of it and kind of got it down. You're talking about an IMSA. IMSA car, okay. yeah. yeah. Set it back down, and we blew it. And I don't think he had talked to Porsche about that, and this was kind of a factory Porsche effort. And – I don't know if they were real happy with me about that because we we figured out some things about the car that were probably something they didn't think about. It's stuff that we looked at. Like we sealed the windshield to the hood with some foam underneath stuff we do on a NASCAR, and it was way better. I yeah. said, like, well, why aren't we doing this? And then the car has a pan under the whole bottom, right? So we started just removing pieces. I'm just I'm trying to find hot spots. You know, I got eight hours to burn here, so I'm going to do it. So it ended up being the best was leaving the middle pan off, and it was way better. So then we did a wing sweep and got all that, and all the, the there's these wickers that slide in and out of the wing, and we got all that worked out. Here's what it does, changes the aero balance this much, and we took all these notes and had the car probably, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 more counts of downforce on it and probably, I don't know, 25 counts of drag out of it from what we started. But the, the rear windows are different. There's some different stuff about it. We changed the way we cooled the rear end coolers and stuff. So we show up down there and the Porsche guys, they're, they're like, what are you, What have you done to this car? And they they recommend running these cars really stiff, right? You ever watch them, they kind of bounce. Well, we figured out a deal at the test down there. We went to the Roar. We were running real soft springs, but we had bump stops that would stop it on the banking so it wouldn't over travel and hit. Yeah. And this is really good. The infield's really good and it's good on the banking. So. I didn't think I was going to go to the race, and Andy and Justin comes in my office, and we're prepping for Daytona for the truck deal. That's my primary job, right? He goes, hey, what do you think about coming down and calling the race? I'm like, yeah, I'd be all for that. That'd be cool, right? And I, they knew I'd done it once before. I said, I got two things, though, we're going to do different. I said, I'm not sitting on your crappy pit box because it killed my back all night. It's a long day. It's, it's not 24 hours. It's more like 36 hours because the garage opens in the morning at like 6 Wow. And you go through a warm-up. There's a 15-minute warm-up, and then you can bring the car back in and work on it and stuff. Yeah. And the Porsches have a little trouble with the half shafts, so we put brand-new half shafts in, and Andy goes and breaks them in at, like, half speed in the warm-up and start the race with brand-new half shafts. So, so I made them bring me a, a table down, and I brought a conference. We had these big, nice conference chairs. And I brought two computers down. I had one for weather and one for the timing and scoring, and I was able to be comfortable all night. That made a huge difference. So we go down and qualify outside pole, and uh, it's Andy and Justin are our primary drivers. And then Porsche gave us Pat Long, who's, I think, one of the best Porsche drivers on the planet, uh, York Bergmeister, and another guy that kicked a little money in to help for Daytona, because very, Daytona is very expensive. I think I put 24 sets on the car the whole weekend, so... It's uh, R.J. Valentine. You ever hear that name? Yeah, he, he's, he's like a gentleman driver. Yeah. And he only wants to drive enough to get a watch. I think you have to drive 30 minutes to yeah. get a watch if you're yeah. on the squad, right? So he doesn't drive till the very end. So we take off, and we're racing the hell out of another factory Porsche. And it's a, it's a dogfight. We're going as hard as we can. They're not, they, you know, you can't just ride. You have to go hard, right? So we're going hard, and we'd worked out a brake change mid-race, so we changed the front and rear rotors and, and calipers and everything. That went real smooth. Guys did a great job. And Pat is like two-tenths quicker than anybody. Andy tweaked his shoulder in qualifying, and he was off just a little bit that night. So he's wearing me out. Put Pat in, put Pat in, right? So Pat ended up driving like 10 hours of the race. And Eventually, the car we were racing, it was us about three laps ahead of the rest of the GTD field. Well, they broke their half shafts with about four hours to go. So we're, in, we're now we are riding, right? And we're riding. And so now Andy's doing most of the driving because he knows the car better than anybody. And he's babying the, the transmission. And so at the end, and I, I got a little mad over this. And me and Kevin Buckler, who's owned the team at the time, he we got into it pretty good after the race over this. And he, he, they're all fired up. They want to put RJ in. Well, he hadn't even, he'd, he'd driven like five minutes in practice, and it rained, and he got out. We're going to win the 24 hours of Daytona, and we're going to stick this guy in. And you got to realize it's not just – there's 50 cars out there, and the, D, the DP cars are six seconds faster. So they're coming, and if you, it's really yeah. easy to get taken yeah. out, and we're going to yeah. win the 24-hour race. Yeah. Just leave Andy in, let him finish. No, 
they put him our JN and Andy ran up on the tower of the, the Goodyear Tower and he talked him through it and he almost got wiped out twice and luckily he didn't and he took the checkered flag and in the end it was all good <laughs> you know what Kevin Buckler gave me for that win three hundred dollars <laughs> that's it did you stay up for the whole race, whole race. I, I got there at six and helped prep the car got everything ready and I stayed up for the whole race. I called the entire race. Never left the box except to use the bathroom. And you got three hundred dollars. He gave me three hundred bucks. I brought and other. My other stipulation was I didn't, didn't say this. I wanted to bring my hauler down, so I had my lounge and stuff. You know, my truck hauler down, my NASCAR truck hauler yeah. down. So they let us do that because I didn't want it. Their their hauler was hectic all the time because he had three or four cars in the race, and there's all these paid drivers, and yeah. they're all a bunch of whiny babies, and I didn't want to <laughs> deal with that. So it yeah. gave me Pat Yorg and Andy and Justin a place to go to talk about it work on it right because yeah. we we, we yeah. you know we got to practice for a couple of days before we got going right and then we had a motor home for them guys to sleep in it was a, i can't imagine what it cost it's probably 300 grand to run that race because it just tires people food i mean you, there's a lot to think about when you do it there's a lot that goes into it we had to have a tent put up because we didn't have you know it can rain so you got to cover everything and they put those white tents up along pit road so there's a lot that goes into it. i learned a lot about logistics doing that you gotta have all the spare parts yeah and luckily we didn't need any but you gotta have them you wind up in the truck series and and you're there for quite a while you were at um with khi and then you were with red horse for most of that time and then you were with brandon bill i finished up with them was that just familiar territory to you was the truck series did it become home yes the uh the truck series from when i started in it in 08 in 09 with TRG and then I went back to Kevin's for a year and it was like old school cup racing the teams kind of worked together you could still there was a lot of ingenuity going into the bodies chassis setups the rules were much looser than a COT or any of the bush stuff that was coming around right uh, Wayne Otten I don't know if you've ever been around Wayne yeah. much but he is one of the I don't understand why Wayne's not running the Cup Series. In my opinion, that's who should be running the Cup Series because he understands this sport probably better than anybody alive right now. He's been there so long and done it. And it was just fun working with him and his guys because you could, you could be off a little bit and he'd work with you to get the show on, right? We were putting a show on. The other thing I liked about it a ton was it backed the schedule way down. And... Frankly, I, you know, I've been married 38 years, I think, and I've probably only been around my wife 15 of them. So being home a lot was awesome. Being around my grandkids, you know, getting born and stuff, that was awesome. And Tom DeLoach is such a smart, intuitive person. It's hard not to enjoy working with him. He taught me something every day about business, people, life, investing you know and this guy was the cfo of mobile <laughs> you know, he's a pretty smart guy right <laughs> so i i loved working there and the one thing i hated about racing all the years was that next deal you got to find that next deal you got to find that next deal ah, my kid needs braces i got to find that next deal my kid's going to college i got to find that next deal right and i didn't have that with me and tom had a handshake deal and i could stay as long as i wanted and it was fun and Tim, Timmy was a really good race car driver for trucks. He, he drove the heck out of the truck every week, gave it all. We won some races. You know, it was good. I think Tom finally got tired of spending money. We never could find a sponsor. And I think that got old for him pretty quick. 2018, you left the sport. What brought that about? Was it just Tom? Well, I'd watched I – don't, I, don't I don't want to say this – nicely because i don't want to i don't want to make anybody feel bad but i'd watch a lot of guys like me that didn't quite make the engineering cut when it changed kind of fall out the bottom of the sport and i didn't want to be that guy right so mr mr brown called me and he was doing a he was trying to put together a bush team for brandon to drive and this is in 2017 Tom had closed the team mid-season. He just had enough, and we'd spent money, 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 money. So I was out of work, and I'm like, i got to do something. So now I'm staying in a hotel up in Fredericksburg, Virginia, four nights a week and driving back and forth. My wife's down here. This is not a good situation. 
the Browns are great people, and they have a great vision of what they want to try to do. We're building a new shop. I help plan all that. And, and really, the theme, I think the reason he hired me is I went up there and I said, look, it don't matter how we run right now. It's all about the infrastructure. If you're going to build a team, you got to get the infrastructure in place first. And we'll go race, but it, you, we're not going to run good because we don't have any infrastructure. So we end up, we'd be a top 20. We I think we run 17th at Dover, and we had probably three-year-old engines out the back door of a place. So it, I was kind of proud of how we ran, and we, we made the cars a lot nicer, and we made the hauler nicer. We did everything we needed to do, and then we went into 018, or 2018, and uh, it was going to be a lot of the same. We'd moved into the new shop, so that was nice, but it's still in Fredericksburg, Virginia. This is not good for me. So a boy that had been my car chief, Billy Haggerty, who's probably one of the best car chiefs I ever had besides uh, Jason Burdett. Him and Jason were about even. He, uh, he, his son was in Boy Scouts with another guy that worked at CAT in Winston-Salem. And they had a secret project going on where they were going to, they had bought Progress Rail and they were going to move their EMD engine production from Chicago, Illinois down to Winston. And it was all secret because they didn't, there was unions involved and a bunch of layoffs. You know, there's, there's laws about that, right? So I went up, interviewed with a guy named um, uh, Jim Watrobe, who he's a drag racer side, you know, on the side and he's drag raced for years. So he kind of got what I was and we hit it off right away. I love Jim. He's a great guy. He's been awesome to me. He's taught me so much about manufacturing. It's a different world than racing. So it took a while. They kind of worked it out, got the money worked out, got everything worked out. And I I think September of 2018 at Richmond was the last race I ever got paid to go work. And I walked out of there. And, you know, I say this a lot. My son worked in racing, too, and he says this, too, because he, he works with me now at, up there. He, he didn't want to miss his kids growing up. Nobody cared. Nobody gave a shit. I put my whole life into it, bled, sweat fought did everything to try to get you know put the show on do the deal and the only person that really calls me regularly is Wayne Otten that's it and it's just the nature of the beast and you can be angry about it or you can't be but it's the nature of sport it moves on right and that's okay and it's one of the, I'm, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come in and talk about it because you know I didn't really get to have that closure <laughs> I, I didn't finish the season you know yeah yeah, yeah. um Best decision I ever made, though, because – and the race proved it. So I had um, Mason Diaz driving that night. He'd rented the car out from underneath Brown, Brandon. And Mr. Brown and Mr. Diaz own Southern National. Is that a track down there? I've never been down there. I think in South Carolina or North Carolina. So he's driving. Um, they got this deal where you could buy old tires way cheaper. So, of course, we're doing it as cheap as we can. So, But you got to buy, like, two sets at the track. So we buy those two sets. So I have to make this decision every week. What am I going to do with these tires? Am I going to run the shit to begin with or the good tires? So I qualify on a good set. That's on the first run. And we qualified like 21st. And Mason drives up to 11th. And I'm thinking, this is winning for us, right? There's four of us full-time on this team against JR Motorsports. You know, some of the best teams in racing, right? Really super good guys with lots of resources. So I feel pretty good about this. And we put the next set on, and we maintain, run the whole segment, like 10th, 9th, 11th. And I ain't got no more tires left. Put the next set on, and it, it's not even the same car. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we ended up 17th or something. And I walked out of there, and I'm like, that's exactly why I made this decision. And I haven't regretted it. I mean, I miss it, but you miss the competition side of it. But I started shooting um, comp competitively with uh, with Billy when we went to work. Billy works with me at Winston Salem now, and that's kind of taken up that. So I get a little bit of fun comp competitive deal with that, and we, we travel around. So you shoot you know. competitive? Yeah, we shoot really? the, the three gun series. Okay. Uh, so you use a rifle, pistol, shotgun on a closed course for time and accuracy. Oh wow! It's fun. They, uh, there's a a monthly match in Ashboro that we shoot, and we go down to Clinton House in South Carolina and shoot. We'll shoot some majors here and there. So we've been to Kentucky and shot. And wow. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And so that's kind of gotten both of us, because Billy changed tires for years too, and it's really, when that buzzer goes off and it, the timer, it goes beep, it's kind of the same thing. Because yeah. it's like, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> so it gets the adrenaline going. So awesome. I'm not as good as I used to be. I'm getting kind of old, but it's still fun, you yeah. know. Anything else you'd like to get across? Anything in particular? Uh, no, I just, I'd really like to thank Steve Mill and Jimmy Makar. Without them, 
I don't think I'd ever be where I was, you know. Them two guys were – they were instrumental in giving me an opportunity to do what I did. And and that goes from the deep, deepest part of my heart because one, pe- one thing I think a piece most people miss is the families that are behind this and the money that we make, what it does, what we do with that money. And that's – raise kids, put braces on. I put my son through college. You know, there's a lot that goes into that and not having the ability to do that, it means something, right? So I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me do this.